All right. It's good to have everybody back. Welcome back to the Johnson abode here. Um, this week, we've got a pretty good lesson. The title of our lesson this week is We Encourage One Another. And the point, we need the encouragement of others and they need ours. And I put an asterisk beside that because it, uh, it's very important. And, and people can say that they don't need anybody else or that they're okay being alone or whatever, but they're not. We are designed to want companionship and it is good. Uh, if you'll notice, even in your relationships, uh, marriages and things like that, that you have to stay on top of making sure that you're complimentary of one another and the things that they do and not let the things we're going to talk about overtake that. But we do need encouragement. Everybody in this <coughs> group that's on today and everybody that will watch this after the fact can think of times in their, their life where they needed encouragement and maybe they didn't get it or they needed encouragement and they did get it. And the, diff the difference between those two things and the, the way that they felt. So we do need encouragement. Our passage is gonna come from Ephesians chapter four, verses 17 through 32. That's Ephesians chapter four, verses 17 through 32. In my instructor book, The Bible Meets Life, says this. The instruct, I'm sorry, the Christian life can be hard at times. Temptations abound and the world continually calls to us. We struggle to live lives of holiness and purity that honor God. Encouragement from fellow believers can be a great help in this struggle. We gain strength as others come alongside us with encouraging words of support. It helps knowing that we are not alone in our struggles, that others wrestle with the same issues and difficulties we do. Our setting, Paul was an expert in encouragement. When Paul, or Saul, became a Christian, some of the other Christians seemed slow to welcome him. And if y'all will remember, uh, Paul was converted, uh, at the time he was Saul, Paul was converted on the road to Damascus, he was blinded at that time, and the way that it describes it is he had some type of scaling over his eyes, and three days later, that was removed, and sometime after that, his name changed from Saul to Paul. <coughs> well, he pretty much immediately started preaching for Christ. And that was different for the people around him and the people that knew him because they knew him as a Christian tormentor, okay? And so when it became a little too hot for him to stay where he was at, and by hot, I mean there were people that were after him, he was whisked away back to where the other apostles were. So he got there and the apostles and, and admittedly so, that, and righteously so, they were a little cautious about accepting Paul into their group because they knew who Paul was as Saul. And it was hard for them to believe, even after walking with Christ all of that time, it was hard for them to believe that anyone as bad, quote, as Saul was could be changed. So, they were a little slow to welcome him. And then it moves on and says, but Barnabas, and Barnabas' uh, nickname meaning son of encouragement. So Barnabas comes alongside Paul. And that's really kind of what encouragement is. It's coming alongside someone and helping them. So you're running a race. And we've seen the, the commercials and we've seen the different things where people were running marathons or whatever. And you've got that that one person who's just given it everything that they've had and they just really don't want to go on any further, but they can see that finish line. They can see where they need to be, but their body is just starting to balk 
and it's not wanting to continue to that finish line and they're so tired. And then you see somebody either come from behind or in the more touching cases, you know, you've got somebody that was ahead of them that noticed this and they fall back and maybe they, they actually grab that person under the shoulders or they come back and they give them encouragement of some kind and they help them get through to complete that race. And for those of you who read your Bible and read Paul, he was a big uh, proponent of using racing as a figurative speech. So Paul comes alongside, or Barnabas comes alongside Paul and introduced him to the Jerusalem church. And Barnabas said, listen, I heard this guy and, and he really is the real deal now and we need to accept him. And, and Barnabas was the one that convinced the apostles that were there at the time to give Paul a chance. Paul often stressed Christians need to encourage one another. For example, therefore encourage one another and build each other up as you are already doing. And that came from 1 Thessalonians 5, 11. Now in your student book, and again, we're using uh, the young adult uh, book of the Bible Studies for Life, Summer Edition, 2020. This is a uh, Christian standard Bible interpretation. But in the Bible Meets Life in the student book, in 1895, 16-year-old Edward Steichen bought a camera and started snapping pictures around the house, 50 of them in fact. When the film was developed, he had 49 bad pictures and only one good one. A picture of his sister at the piano. His father thought that was a poor showing, but his mother insisted that one photo was beautiful and more than compensated for 49 failures. Her encouragement convinced the boy to stick with his new hobby. Edward pressed on to become one of the world's most renowned photographers, but in the beginning, he almost gave up. What pushed him forward were his mother's encouraging words in the midst of a lot of failure. The Christian life can be hard at times. Temptations abound, and we sometimes struggle to honor God in our lives. Encouragement from fellow believers is a great help in this struggle. Their words of support push us forward when we might be tempted to give in or give up. We need the encouragement of other believers, and they need ours. And as we move forward through our lessons, um, and, we, and we talk about encouragement and the things we need to do, we need to think about what uh, he just wrote there. We that have been Christians longer. And some on here have been Christians longer than I have, and I've been Christians long, or a Christian longer than some others. But for those of us who have been Christians for a while, who have faced the world's temptation, who have faced those changes when we first became Christian, and the, the friends that tried to lead you back astray and those things, We've already faced all that. We've already ran that race to keep with our analogy. Um, so we know what to expect. Well, a younger, more immature Christian, whether by age or simply by just being a young Christian, and I think it is compounded when you have a new a believer, a new Christian that is young in age uh, because there's more peer pressure at that time. As we get older, those around us tend to figure out that you know, we're not gonna be tempted by the things that they do. We're not gonna be led astray so much by the things that they do. So they, they don't work as hard uh, against us. But that younger Christian, those people still work hard against them and the younger Christian has a, an increased opportunity or tendency maybe to fail in that Christian walk. And that's not, there's not anything wrong with that. Uh, our spiritual and our mortal beings are at war with each other all the time. And until that new Christian maybe gets to where we're at, and not to say that we don't fail, uh, those of us who are more, quote, mature Christians, we do fail. 
uh, that's not what I'm getting at, but the, the instances or the, uh, the time frame between those failures are just not as much. So as we study this and we, we think about encouraging, remember that those younger, uh, more immature Christians need encouragement, say a lot more than maybe uh, some of us on this call here or this Zoom meeting need. <clears throat> All right, let's get into our lesson. The first question for you to think about is when have you benefited from a little encouragement? So keep that in mind. Uh, today. Our first set of scriptures is going to come from Ephesians chapter 4 verses 17 through 22. Now this, this uh, set of scriptures here identify four characteristics of our ungodly lifestyle that we should forsake in our new godly lifestyle. So as we read through here, Let's identify those four characteristics. Therefore, now that first word again, I, I bring it up almost every time. When we see the word therefore, that means we're transitioning from something. And in this case, we can go back through the previous scriptures, but in this case, we're transitioning from an old self, the old unchristian self, to the new self or the Christian self. So that's what we're talking about. Therefore, I say this and testify in the Lord. You should no longer live as the Gentiles live in the futility of their thoughts. They are darkened in their understanding, excluded from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them and because of the hardness of their hearts. They became a callous, <laughs> they became callous and gave themselves over to promiscuity for the practice of every kind of impurity with a desire for more and more. But that is not how you came to know Christ, assuming you heard about him and were taught by him, as the truth is in Jesus, to take off your former way of life, the old self that is corrupted by deceitful desires. Okay. It sounds like Paul is really railing here on the Gentiles, and he is. <laughs> I mean, we can't, we can't step away from that. He is railing on them. But a point that I want to make is, is up until this point, up until now, most of the most of the of Christ's walk and the apostles' walk were to the, the Hebrew children the Jewish believers, uh, and, and as I was talking to my wife the other night, I understand that you know Judaism or Jew is a religion, but in that day, almost everyone was Jew. Uh, it's not so much anymore, but they were Jew. So when I say that, I understand I'm talking about that the Hebrew people. But most of the the lessons and the teaching and all of that were directed toward those people because that was God's chosen people. Not to say God didn't care about the Gentiles, okay? But they just had not received anything. Now, here in, a, here in Scripture, if we'll, if you, when you read through your Bible, you'll understand, one, that God gives Peter a vision of clean and unclean. And pretty much he tells him, hey, listen, whatever I made is clean. Okay, and, and a lot of people still practice the clean and unclean, but in our Bible, in the New Testament, it says that God gave Peter a vision of the clean and unclean, and he said, listen, what I made is clean. It's okay. It's good, and immediately, you know, there was a knock on the door where the house Peter was staying in. He comes down from the rooftop, which is where he was at when he received the vision, and it was a Gentile and a couple companions that needed help for a sick person. And some people were like, hey, they're Gentiles, you know, don't worry with it, you can just leave them be. But Peter remembered this vision and he said, you know what, no, God made these people and they should be a part of us. So at that time, 
and Paul was the same way. He, he, their focus was on the, the Jews, but Paul went into a lot of Gentile areas. Uh, it changed right about where we're talking about here. It changed the, the way, it, the lifestyle. It was no longer Jew and Gentile, where Jew hated Gentile, Gentile hated Jew. And then you had, as we studied the other evening, the Samaritans, which was sort of a blend. The Jews didn't want the Samaritans. The Gentiles didn't want the Samaritans. So the Samaritans were sort of out there on their own, which makes the story of the Good Samaritan. <clears throat> so as we look at this, that's the backdrop here uh, when he's talking about this, because he's talking to the Jewish believers in a in an area that has some Gentile teachings and some Gentile worship. So, so the first characteristic uh, that we can look at is we should no longer live as the Gentiles. Now, I understand you and I uh, that are on this call are, are Gentiles. That's where we came from. And we are saved. So uh, that did, did change in history. So should no longer live as Gentiles. That's, that's one of the characteristics. Okay? And, and it says... In the, the scripture here, you should no longer live as the Gentiles in the futility of their thoughts. Now, he's not saying that there were not some smart people. There were some smart people in the Gentile race. And um, I guess to say they were intellectually brilliant is one thing, but he's saying that's not all it takes. We can think of people even in our country and our society that are very smart people, but that's not going to help them get saved. And a lot of times all that quote knowledge that they have, that smartness is actually a hindrance to that. I guess that's why God didn't give me a lot of it because he, he didn't want it to be a hindrance to me. But he's just saying that, all of that brilliant thought that they may have and maybe the advances they have, none of that, none of that is going to help them when it comes to Christ and when it comes to salvation. So in the futility of their thoughts, you, we can be as smart as we want to be. But if those thoughts aren't leading us to, um, if those thoughts aren't leading us to Christ, then we've failed. That's, that's what it's saying. It says they are darkened in their understanding, excluded from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them. Now, again, we've spoken about this before. It's okay to be ignorant. We're all ignorant on things. However, in a lot of things, it's not okay to stay ignorant. So when you become a Christian, you're still saved and I'm not going to take that away, but what I'm saying is, is it's not okay to just say, okay, I got saved on August the 16th, 2020, I'm done. No, that's not what we're saying. What we're saying is, is you need to study. You need to put some time in. You need to grow. You need to mature so that when, when you get older, you can help somebody else who is younger than you. And again, maybe that's age. Maybe that's just in Christian maturity but you can help someone else and then that person grows and that's the way it's been for years. So we, we don't need to stay ignorant. And then it goes on to say, because of the hardness of their hearts. So, you know, uh, a lot of times people that don't work with their hands, let's use this as sort of an example here people who are not used to working with their hands and all of a sudden they need to dig, you know, 50 post holes with, with post hole diggers. And for those of you who may not know what a post hole digger is, it's got two handles and usually it's about, you know, five, six feet long total. And on the end, it's got two cut blades. And when you shove those into the ground, and then you pull the handles apart, it closes the thing, the jaws at the end, and it grabs the dirt and you pick it up and drop it. And you just keep doing that. Well, if you've been doing that for a little while, 
your hands will get hard. And then here in a moment, it says they became callous. So then you get these calluses on those hands. And a lot of people have had calluses. Maybe they've had an ill-fitting pair of shoes or something like that. But we get those calluses. Well, when we get those calluses and that stuff hardens up, those post hole diggers don't hurt quite like they did in the beginning. It don't tear our skin. Our skin doesn't become inflamed like it used to. So when he's talking about this here, he's talking about the hardness of their heart. So their heart has grown hard uh, in, in the lifestyle that they, they're living. Okay, it, it doesn't have Christ and their heart has grown hard. So when this new teaching comes in, they don't want that. And, and to the point to where it's, it's become callous. It, you, you just can't get through it. You can't, you can take, you know, if you've got a, a good callus that's been on your hand, you know, you can take a needle and stick a needle in that callus and it doesn't hurt. And that's where they're at. The, 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 the message is not getting through that callousness of their heart. It's just not getting through there. And, and we get that way sometimes, I think. And, and our country, uh, here in the you know, USA, our country is becoming that way. It's becoming very callous in its thinking. It's becoming very callous in its actions. And Christ is no longer able to get through. And yes, our churches are becoming very callous. There are churches out there that are refusing to stand anymore who have let all the world come into the church and it's changing the church dynamic. And when I say church, it is a building, but I'm talking about the people, the church people. Uh, there are things going on. Uh, and, you know, we talk about this a lot, but, you know, we, we need sinners to come to church, okay? We need sinners to come to the church building because that's where a lot of times they're going to get the message. So when people are living lifestyles that are not conducive to the Christian walk, we, we need those people to come to church and, or we need to go to them and both. But we don't need, one, those lifestyles that they lead disrupting the church and the Bible does give us recourse if that's the case. We go to them once, we go through them twice. And if we have to go through them a third time, it says that we can actually exclude them from the church. But, but we need them there. Now, what we don't need is an unchanged, unrepentant heart taking leadership roles in the church, such as becoming pastors and things such as that. When you've got a sinful person li living a sinful lifestyle, and they're supposedly leading the church. Well, they're not leading a godly church anymore. And we have that all across this country. And then another example that I heard the other day, and I've got a few examples I'm gonna share. I was watching one of uh, the people I watch on YouTube a lot. He was on a little rant, and, I, and rightfully so, I believe. So <clears throat> he and his family, but his wife, and children, they've been in classical conversations, which is a, um, a homeschool program that our grandchildren did for a little while, and then they do another one now. But they have been holding their one day a week meeting where all of the classical conversation children and parents, parents got to come, go to meet. So our daughter, they did theirs at the local library, but they were going to this church. And it was a Baptist church for those of you who are on here. And so what happened is this, the classical conversation is quote, a for-profit company and they are, they, they, they have to take in money uh, to meet their needs and things such as that, pay some teachers and, and do all of that. But so somebody uh, wrote to the church and I don't know who it was because there's people after this guy all the time for his Christian stance. But, uh, and said, listen, we're going to turn you in to the state and you're going to get your 501c3 status removed because you're allowing a for-profit group to come into your non-profit church and utilize it. Well, the church said, hey, we're not going to let y'all come anymore. And, and even after he talked to them, they weren't going to allow it. And then he ran into that same roadblock with a few other churches. So his point was, is where has the church gone? 
Why are we letting the world guide us? Why are we letting the world take a hold of us? And, and, and rightfully so, I think he should be mad. Uh, we shouldn't let that depict the way that we, we do a Christian style schooling. <clears throat> so he, he's upset and I don't blame him. Back to our study, uh, verse 20, but that is not how you came to know Christ. It's, I mean, you heard about him and were taught by him as the truth in, is in Jesus to take off your former way of life, the old self that is corrupted by deceitful desire. So it's like a disrobing is what he's saying. We're going to take off that old nasty clothing that before we got to the bathtub we were wearing. And we're going to take off that old nasty dirty clothing and and we're going to put on a new body here in just a moment. So, Ephesians chapter 4, verses 23 through 28. I've got to speed along here a little bit. We've got about 12 or 13 minutes left. To be renewed in the spirit of your minds and to put on the new self, the one created according to God's likeness and righteousness and purity of truth. Therefore, putting away lying, speak the truth, each one to his neighbor, because we are members of one another, being be angry and do not sin. Don't let the sun go down on your anger and don't give the devil an opportunity. Let the thief no longer steal. Instead, he is to do honest work with his hands so that he has something to share with anyone in need. So back to our put on the new self. We're going to reclothe. We're going to put on new clean clothing. And that new clean clothing is the spirit of Christ that is in us. And then it goes on to say in verse 24, the one created according to God's likeness. <laughs> now, if we're putting on the new self created in God's likeness, that means before that we were not in God's likeness. And everybody goes back to Genesis. You know, in Genesis, it stated Man was created in God's image, and that is true. We were created in God's image, a spiritual image, a spiritually clean image. But in, then if you'll fast forward from Genesis 1 to Genesis 5, it says in that that Seth was born. That was Adam and Eve's, one of their next sons, third son, we think. But Seth was born in Adam's image, not in Christ's image, not in God's image, not in the Holy Spirit's image, but in Adam's image, which means there was a separation that had occurred, and that separation was sin. So now we are no longer born into God's image, spiritually clean. We are born into man's image, spiritually unclean. Now, when does that actually take place. Well, when that actually takes place is when we reach that age of accountability that we so often talk about. And so a young baby, you know, two, three, four, five-year-old, if, if they die, they're not going to hell that, because they were born of a sinful nature. They haven't reached that age of accountability yet where they know the decisions they're making are right and wrong. And that's a whole other thing. I just want to throw that out. But, <clears throat> but we are now in that other sinful image. So when we put on this new body, we are putting on a new God's likeness, okay, in righteousness and purity of truth. And then it goes on to say, uh, therefore putting away lying. Ooh, lying. Lying is good. Uh, lying is very detrimental to anything, right? To anything, even for people who live a life, you know, these clan, we talk about spies and different things that have these clandestine lifestyles. Sometimes even that lying, if you don't keep up with your lies, gets them in trouble. So if you, if you lie to one another and that gets found out, man, that causes a rift that sometimes never heals or sometimes takes a long time to heal. It says, therefore, putting away the line, speak the truth. Okay, so speak the truth. Sometimes the truth hurts. It does hurt. But, but we can soften that truth up when we speak to people. People need to hear the truth, 
especially about Christ and their separation from Christ. They need to hear that, but it doesn't need to be shoved down their throats, and you don't need to call attention to every little sinful thing you see going on in their life. Actually, the Bible teaches against that for us uh, because our lives aren't perfect either. So we need to make sure our lives are in order for one. But two, we just don't need to go in there and write a list and say, I've seen you doing this, and this, and this, and I heard you say that, and that, and that. We need to say it in a way that is beneficial to that other person. Each one to his neighbor, and that's what we're talking about because we are members of one another. We're all of the human race. And then he's speaking specifically to believers of the Christian walk in this text, okay? So he's actually saying our neighbor and the member of one another as the church. So be angry and do not sin. So is he, is he giving us the green light to get mad? Yes and no. <clears throat> we know the story that even Christ got angry, okay? We know that. He went into the temple, and I mean, and he did. He pitched a pretty good fit, and but what? It, but he he was angry over the unrighteousness. He was angry over the way they were using the temple, the way that they had contaminated the temple. It, there was a lot of things that he was angry about, and he he threw all those people out. He said, "You're not going to do this in here." So what it's saying is, hey, y'all, it's okay for us to get angry if it's about unchristian things, I guess to say. It's okay for us to get angry and, and, and try to fix those unchristian things. Now, when we get angry, Sometimes we as humans say things that either one were just untrue or two say things that have built up inside of us over a period of time. Then we get angry and we just unleash all of that at one time on someone. And that's not right. Okay, If we would be truthful in the beginning, that stuff wouldn't build up in us for one, which is part of what he's saying here. But we shouldn't let that occur, okay? We shouldn't lose our focus. We shouldn't use words that are not good. And I want to skip to verse 28 uh, real quick. Let the thief no longer steal. Instead, he's to do honest work with his own hands so that he has something. And what I want to bring up there is another example that was on the news several years back. Some of you may or may not remember this. I've mentioned it in my class before, but there was a young man in Memphis that was shot breaking into a home. And there was a little uprising there because he was shot breaking into this home. But I never will forget his sister when they were interviewing her for the news. And she made the statement, how else is he supposed to get stuff? You know, like the only way for people to obtain stuff is to go steal from others who have. Well, that's not what Paul said. Paul said, do honest work. Now, it says with your hands, but it could be intellectual work, but just do honest work and provide for yourself. Don't take from others just because they have. And that's where our society also is, right? Take from that one because they have it and I don't and I want it. And, and because they have it, they have to be bad. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 29 through 32. No foul language should come from your mouth, but only what is good for building up someone in need so that it gives grace to those who hear. And don't grieve God's Holy Spirit. You were sealed by him for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness, anger, and wrath, shouting, and slander be removed from you along with all malice. And be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving one another, just as God also forgave you in Christ. So no foul language should come forth because y'all, if they hear us talking like the world, they're going to think we are of the world. And yes, I've had this description many or discussion many, many times. And 
a lot of the curse words that we use are not listed in the Bible. Okay, they're not there. What makes those words curse words? It's because of the way that we use them and the, their intent. And most of the time, those words come out in anger. So those words, those four letter words and three word words and things like that, that's why they're bad because of the intent of their purpose, not so much the word itself. So if anybody comes to you with that argument, say, yeah, it's not in the Bible. I agree, but here's why you use it. All right. So we need to build up people. And uh, the, the example I wanted to use there, Phil Robertson, he said it before, but the other day I was listening to the podcast and uh, he was one of the sound men when they were doing Duck Dynasty. You know, they were always mic'd up. And he came to him after all of these shows and hours and hours and hours of, of this. And he, and he talked to Phil. He's like, you know, all of these hours y'all were mic'd up. And even when we weren't recording, I could hear you all. And I never heard foul language or, un, or hateful language come from your family. And from that, it led to this gentleman becoming saved. And now he stays in contact with Phil. So, you know, by living a lifestyle for other people to see, we can lead others to Christ. And then it goes on to tell us, hey, we're sealed. So in the olden days, you know, they would take a package, a parchment, something, and they'd take a big wax glob, and then they would put their seal on it so that it couldn't be broken without someone knowing. God has sealed us, and the only person that can break that seal would be God, and he ain't going to let us go. So he has sealed us. He is keeping us is forever okay <clears throat> and then it goes on in 31 and 32 it recaps the changes let all bitterness anger and wrath shouting and slander be removed from you along with all malice then it tells us what to be be kind and compassionate to one another forgiving one another just as god also forgave you in christ we can't hold we can't, we can't hold unforgiveness about someone else because Christ forgave us. And if he can forgive us for the lifestyle we were leading, then we should forgive our brother and sister for the lifestyle that they are leading. So get, get rid of the anger. Don't go to sleep on it because it just festers and festers and festers. And then you do stupid things. Talk about it. Get it out. Pray about it. Talk to the other person. Get that out, okay? Real quick, got about a minute here. How will you use your words to encourage others in the body of Christ? Consider the following applications. Talk to God. Through prayer, ask God to bring to light any words, phrases, or patterns of speech that you need to put away. Ask God for the grace needed to speak words of life and encouragement instead. Talk to yourself. One of the best ways to talk to yourself is speaking the word of God to yourself. In that light, consider memorizing Ephesians 4, 29. No foul language should come forth from your mouth, but only what is good for building up someone in need so that it gives grace to those who hear. Talk to others. Identify three people who might be encouraged by your words. Write cards, craft emails, send texts, or meet with them face-to-face -to, -face to encourage them in their walk with Jesus. No one grows as a Christian in isolation, and very little spiritual growth happens without the encouragement of other believers God has placed in our path. Be that person who encourages with both words